Hello everyone, bringing you a video today which is essentially a video that was requested by several people I spoke to at Victory Show, which is to make a video looking in detail at recreation of the kit of a Shindit. Now this is a recreation of kit for British soldiers serving on the second Shindit operation, Operation Thursday. The initial operation, Operation Longcloth, was essentially a, a ground-based operation with raids uh, behind Japanese lines. The second operation, Operation Thursday, varied this in having an airborne component. The troops were actually airlifted into Burma and they set up fortified bases from which to operate. And in that regard, it was the first time this sort of operation had been conducted. At the time, early 1944, when this was carried out, it was the largest airborne operation which had ever been conducted. Much as the, the troops were glider borne and then airlifted in, as opposed to parachuting in, uh, it was still the largest air mobile operation, I suppose, if you want to use the more modern term, which had taken place at, up to this point. And it really pioneered this sort of deep penetration operation uh, on a much grander scale than had been carried out previously. And overall was quite successful, obviously. The operation uh, it was marred by the fact that towards the end of the, op of the operation, the troops were really misused and their health was shot by that point and they were used as, as basically as standard infantry without the support that would normally be expected for infantry troops and obviously suffered very heavy casualties as a result of that. That's a story in and of itself. The main point of this video is to have a look at the kit and equipment as recreated uh, with me wearing it and we'll have a look at that now. We'll talk about the kit and equipment in some detail. So looking at an overview of the recreation here, the uniform is fairly typical for that worn in the Far East in 1944. You obviously have the slouch hat here, the Indian-made jungle clothing, and Indian-made 1937 pattern web equipment. But there are some details which mark out the Chindit soldiers in terms of customising the equipment and the way the uniform is worn, and we're going to get into that and talk about that in some detail now. The first thing we'll look at here is the weapon carried, and this is the rifle number one Mark III Star, of course formerly the SMLE, the short magazine Lee Enfield. This was being supplanted at this time by the rifle number four, but issue of the new rifle was primarily restricted to Europe at this time, certainly in early 1944, when the men of the Chindits were deployed on Operation Thursday, and their rifle, the rifle they were carrying as standard, was still the rifle number one Mark III star. It was only later in 1944 that the number four would begin to make an appearance in the Far East with men of 14th Army. We'll move on now to talk about the uniform, and we'll start at the top as we normally do with headgear, which in this case consists of a fur felt slouch hat. This was standard issue for British troops in the Far East at this time. Although men in 14th Army, more regular units, would also be seen wearing the helmet, the Mark II helmet. The slouch hat was standard headdress for the Shindits. This is a particularly battered example worn flatter back on the back of the head, and it simply bears the plain white hat band, which was standard on these. Puggeries were then added later by some, but it's not uncommon. In fact, it's very common to see hats worn in the field with just this white tape band. You'll also notice in this close-up uh, several days growth of facial hair in addition to the moustache. Records show that shaving varied somewhat from battalion to battalion within the brigades which made up Operation Thursday, but certainly as the operation continued, shaving became less and less practicable and less and less common. By the end of the operation, many men sported full beards. Of course, this is only a few days growth, but just to illustrate that point. The basic uniform consists of a mix of Indian manufactured clothing. You have an Angola shirt. Uh, Angola is a cotton wool mix flannel. Very comfortable, in fact. It wicks away sweat and is also a lot harder wearing than Airtex or cellular clothing and was therefore very popular in the Far East at the time. This has had a collar added. The original design simply featured a cotton tape collar as you would see on British collarless shirts, the, the standard British issue collarless shirt at the time. It was very common for these to be retailed with a collar as we see here with some material taken from the skirts which is exactly what's been done with this example of the shirt. The trousers are from the Indian battle dress uniform. This is a cotton battle dress consisting of a cellular blouse which has been replaced with the shirt and then these cotton drill trousers. These conform to battle dress pattern in having a map pocket on the front of the left leg the wearer's left leg, and then the dressing pocket on the front of the wearer's right leg. And the waist fastens with two small straps with pronged buckles. The equipment carried is a marching order set of 1937 pattern web equipment. This is all of Indian manufacture. The turnover of web equipment in the Far East at this time was quite significant. It doesn't last very well. It's not rock proofed or certainly wasn't rock proofed at the time. 
and in the tropical conditions it didn't last very well, it would be very common to see men entirely equipped with Indian manufactured uh, components of the equipment as we have here. At the front we have the two basic pouches which of course are designed to take Bren gun magazines, they'll also take rifle ammunition and bandoliers and hand grenades as well. On the right hip a water bottle is carried and this is a standard felt covered enamelled water bottle. This differs from British and other British Commonwealth and Empire examples in that it fastens with a buckle over the shoulder of the bottle rather than using a press stud. And behind this a British manufactured machete is carried on the belt. On the opposite hip, on the left hip, we have the bayonet for the rifle number one Mark III star. And this is a shortened Indian pattern bayonet. It's essentially a shortened version of the 1907 pattern sword bayonet. And this is carried on the belt behind the haversack. As I said, the equipment is carried in marching order, so the haversack has been suspended from the brace ends of the equipment. In here would be carried mess tins, you'd have limited washing and shaving items, perhaps the towel, limited personal items and more rations potentially as well crammed in here. On the back, the pack is carried, and this is of course carried over from the 1908 pattern equipment for use with the 1937 pattern equipment. Again, this is manufactured in India. And in here would be carried half a blanket, you might have some spare clothing, and again, more rations carried in here as well. The load carrying capacity of the pack has been expanded upon with the addition of two utility pouches which have been sewn and riveted to the sides of the pack. And this was a common chin dip modification to the pack to increase the load carrying capacity. And as you can see, these neatly carry two K ration boxes. So they give another four units of the K ration. So essentially one day's and a bit's worth of K rations could be carried in these side pockets. I say that, of course, the K ration is designed with the intention that three of these units would be eaten each day. In reality, the Chindits often had to survive on less than that, which is not ideal given the fact the K ration, even with all three units being consumed in a day, did not really contain enough calories to sustain an active soldier, particularly in the arduous conditions of the jungle. The final thing to look at is the footwear, and this consists of a standard pair of British GS or ammo boots. Nothing special about these at all. It's the standard British hobnailed ankle boot made in pebble grain leather, as you can see. In general terms, thinking of the army as a whole, these were usually worn with anklets or perhaps short putties. Short putties, of course, becoming increasingly common with the men of 14th Army as the war in the Far East dragged on. However, the chindits tended not to bother with these at all, which is what's been replicated here. The trousers are just worn over the boots. So looking again at the overview of the recreation here, as I say, you can see that most of the uniform and equipment is basically standard with some minor modifications to account for the chindit specific operations in the jungle, including the increased carrying capacity and the fact that the equipment is carried in full marching order in order to carry the kit and equipment, and primarily the rations required for these long range operations. So hopefully you found it interesting looking at this. As I say, this was requested by several people I spoke to uh, Victory Show suggested making a video looking at the kit in the sort of standard format that I use and that's what we've done here. Hopefully it's a bit of interest and hopefully this serves as something of a guide maybe to those who want to put this kit together themselves. I'm planning a video talking about that in more detail as well. It's rather difficult because no one really reproduces the items, certainly in terms of uniform, that are needed for recreating British troops serving in the Far East at this time. But nevertheless, I'm going to make a video talking about that in some detail. If, you've, if you'd like to see that going forward and if you've enjoyed watching this and found this interesting, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down below as well. That's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.